Welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we begin some housekeeping remarks, uh, number one, the karaoke competition has been canceled. Sorry to report, sorry Mark, that Inga Saffron can't be here, her flying broom is in the shop. <laughs> Mayor Kenny sends his regrets, he's in the hospital, he's in surgery, he's having a spinal implant. So I'm left here with my actual friends, too many of whom could not be here because of COVID or family responsibilities, and my people told me that I should not list them all. So now I'm like Joe Biden. It's the big 8-0 which mandates some remarks about aging. Will Rogers said, you know you're getting old when everything either dries up or leaks. Or busts, like my knee. Uh, he also said you'll reach a point where you stop lying about your age and start bragging about it. I have not reached that point. When I was a kid, like most of you, I think, I wanted to be older. This is not what I expected. I get most of my healthy color from liver spots. I don't know how much time I have left. My doctor says, don't buy green bananas. <laughs> when I was in my 60s, I felt like a pretty cool dude because I had friends in their 20s. Some of them are here tonight and they're all middle-aged. Right, Dan Gross? Right, Steve Essick? I'm waiting for your answers. <laughs> so, okay, today is my business. Get ready, Kenny. A few weeks ago, it was the 80th birthday for Martha Reeves, lead singer of the Vandellas. Dancing in the streets, that's what we have here. Martha is still working, and so am I. She gets paid to do it. I do it for free on StuBikowski.com because I have something to say. Chai will tell you I always have something to say. And what I'm saying now... <laughs> Anyone can tell me that. Is that my sister? <laughs> uh, what I'm saying now is the party needs a theme, uh, and this one is friendship. Thank you for being here, my friends. You don't have to be close to someone to be close to them. Friendship is not conditional on proximity or constant contact. Some of you I don't even see once a year, but we remain close because we each know that if we are in trouble, the other will be there. Some of you might have been a source or a tipster. Some of you might have been, uh, had my back when I was under attack. Uh, some of you might have felt that I'd done something for you. But even in that case, I'm in your debt because allowing me to fulfill my destiny as a journalist, to tell the truth as I see it, to help those who need it, and to kick, kick the butt of those who abuse authority. While I tell a story, uh, Please fill your glasses for your toast that will come in a minute. Uh, my relationship with Jack Benitez is on the rocks. Do I have my Jack? Okay, will somebody give me a glass of Jack while I'm talking? Thank you. Uh, a few weeks ago on LinkedIn, I accepted a connection from somebody I did not know, but he knew me. He was an ex-con, uh, excuse me, returning citizen, <laughs> who I had written about because I believe after you pay your debt to society, you should be welcomed back. As a result of what I wrote, he wrote he got job offers and launched a new life. He wrote to thank me. Nothing could have made me happier. Some 40 years ago, I, one of my temple, I got one of my temple students a summer intern job and introduced him to Atlantic City to Tony Bennett for an interview. He wound up being friends with Tony. Thank you, dear. Uh, it was nothing to me, but it was everything to him, and we are still in touch. He is now an anchor in Cleveland on TV. When a guy named Bill Mann ordered my book, he sent along a note, quote, I'll never forget how you got me Frank Sinatra's autographed photo those many years ago from my stepfather, unquote. Yes, back in the day, I could do that. Nothing to me, but everything to him. So now, I want to propose a toast. There are blessings to old age, assuming your health is good, but one of the curses is that you lose friends. I have lost three close friends, my closest friends, one earlier this month. I will say their names. Jim Moran, Harry J. Katz, Kurt Block. Join me. Say the names of your friends that you have lost as we drink in their memory and we take a moment of silence.
Thank you. Well, hi. Well, hi. If I were an artist, somebody writing about my life might talk about my periods, the Bronx period, the Brooklyn period, the projects, college, Philadelphia, which is itself subdivided into jobs before the Daily News, jobs at the Daily News, plus the Mummers, the Penn and Pencil Club, Winfield, South Philly, Center City, many periods, some blue, some rose. Here, my notes say wing it, something Joe Biden never gets. So uh, I'm going to start with my oldest friend in the world, Jerry Goldstein, lived next door to me in a tenement in the Bronx. Uh, he is immunodeficient. Uh, he lives in the Bronx still to this day. Unbelievable, the only person I know still in New York City, except he's not in New York City. He's riding out the pandemic in Vermont, so he couldn't be here. So my second oldest friend in the Bronx is my dear sister here. Picture in the carriage next to me in the sailor suit on that picture that my sweet child had done without my knowledge. So uh, my sister is my oldest friend and she's the best person I know until she gets to speak. <laughs> Um, so now let me look around the room and I, I will probably uh, demonstrate intersectionality before the academics ruin it. Um, my, uh, my granddaughter is here from West Virginia. She is the second furthest. My uh, sister came from Florida. Where's my granddaughter, Sammy Jo? Stand up and wave. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <filming. laughs> Uh, and Joe, Sam, and Joe, my sister had been the academic genius in the family, getting all the awards. My granddaughter is like a straight A student uh, in West Virginia. We couldn't be more proud of her, and I hope a good videographer to be in Star. <laughs> Say hello to Sam and Joe. Okay. Uh, my sister, my brother in law, my son, Shaw, also from West Virginia, his girlfriend, Shirley. And uh, when I go back now, so I've covered the Bronx, that would be my sister. <laughs> what I don't see right now is Gordon Latte back there. Okay, Gordon Latte was hiding in a corner. Gordon Latte was the editor of the Brooklyn College Evening Magazine called Ken. When I showed up there uh, after graduating from high school, a little behind my class, uh, six months behind, in 1959, I walked into the, the evening magazine, a newspaper figuring, maybe I can do this, I don't know. Uh, I didn't think of myself as a frat guy. I wasn't gonna join the math club for crying out loud. So I said, hey, can I try out? He said, yes. He gave me an assignment, I wound up on the staff. A few months later, he, then uh, an employee at the, of the New York World Telegram and Sun, got me a job as a copy boy at the World Telegram and Sun in 1959, which was the start of my paid journalism career. 59 to when I retired, supposedly in, 19, in 2019, 60 years. So that's Gordon. And then 10 years later, Gordon, who had left the World Telegram and Sun, worked for Reuben H. Donnelly, a publisher, appointed me the Philadelphia Bureau Chief of Travel Age East, a travel publication in Philadelphia. That was the third time he gave me a job. And that job opened the door for me to travel free all around the world, which gave me a taste for champagne. Unfortunately, when I got fired from that job because of some crappy boss, I still had the taste, but I could only afford, I could only afford beer. So, so he was like the first one to hire me. Now, uh, Jenny, where are you? Jenny DeHuff was the last person to hire me, this gorgeous woman over here. Uh, who was one of my successors at the, uh, the Daily News of the Gossip Column. She was doing that and she got bounced because they were firing anyone who was good. And she wound up the editor of Philadelphia Weekly and she said, why don't you become a contributor for us? And I did, so therefore I did. So now I'm on the byline, uh, a byline reporter there and I'm really happy to be there. Intersectionality. Now, uh, Jenny was one of the people who replaced Dan Gross. There's Dan Gross over there. Dan Gross, who filled my shoes adequately, not superiorly, but adequately, uh, as a gossip columnist. Hello, hello, oh my God, is that, oh! I'm so glad, Kitty, you're here. Okay, intersectionality. Okay, 
We talked about Dan. Dan was the president of our local, the local town of the newspaper guild. And here, he succeeded. He succeeded me as a gossip columnist, and he succeeded Kitty Caparella as the president of the local, uh, local town of the newspaper guild. So I am total union all the way, and Kitty is the only person at the Daily News who I ever fucking feared. And that's, that's the truth. Okay. So, intersectionality. So over here, we have Mark Schwartz, who is my attorney, uh, in my suit against the Daily News for defamation. And where's Ralph? Ralph is there right now. Mark is a new friend. Ralph Cipriano back there is also a new friend. He was the first reporter to sue the Inquirer successfully. I hope to be the second. So Ralph and I have been new friends. Mark and I are new friends. Mark is a little loony, you know? Okay. Across from that, Mark is Mark Siegel, the publisher of the Philadelphia Gay News. Probably my oldest friend in Philadelphia. One who defended me when the gay community was going to get on me because I wrote something about Ben Midler being gay friendly or something or other. They were going to be calling me up in the middle of the night or something. And Mark said, you don't know Stu, you don't understand. He's okay. So they laid off me. So thank you, Mark. Mark is, is my old friend in Philadelphia. Yes. Okay. Uh, so moving along, we have now next to Mark, is Bob Simon, my, my uh, financial services guy from Merrill Lynch. And uh, Bob took me on when I didn't have a pot to piss in. Now, thanks to his services, I have a pot to piss in. Thank you. That was really good. Okay. So, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, over there, we have a couple of uh, neighbors. Uh, Bob Hanlon, and, uh, who is a retired civil engineer, and uh, my friend uh, Michael Seidman, who's a retired lawyer, now an actor, and he was a novelist before I, and their respective wives, and these are friends and neighbors of mine who I actually socialize with, and it's really good. Um, oh, uh, there's a couple of people I have to say to last. Uh, I'm, I'm missing something. Okay, Tigre Hill was uh, a young guy with an ambition. He wanted to be a documentarian. A documentarian. Uh, I found out about him somehow. I wrote about him because he was deserving. He was hardworking. He wanted to do something, and that was I don't know 35 years ago. And we've become we've remained friends over that uh, over all that time. Um, in the back, who I can't see now, there's Tony Clark and his friend Tom Weston. Uh, Tony was a guy I wrote about. Um, I called him the Flag Man. He was a guy on his own time who went around to replace American flags that were tattered or in bad shape, that were flying over Philadelphia public schools, uh, rec centers, um, uh, parks, and on his own dime, he did this. And I wrote about him, he wound up getting me in trouble because somebody said that he wasn't working just on his own time. Truth is, he probably did go overtime somewhat. But is this what the hack, is this what you're going to harass a guy for, for doing something patriotic like that? doing something generous. Uh, one of the later people to walk in is Yvonne Oosley, uh, who was a, a city desk editor at the Inquirer, sometimes editor of mine, but also a person who always had my back. And four years ago, when the Daily News unfortunately was melded into the Inquirer, I moved into a hostile work environment. And it turns out, so did Yvette. She's leaving, I think, at the end of the month. Um, and through Yvette, now it, it was a connection between Yvette, one of my newest friends, and Gordon, one of my oldest friends. Each year, I would go to the um, Army-Navy game with Gordon, who's a devoted Navy uh, aficionado. And a few years ago, after Yvette's son, Ben, a wonderful young man, was accepted into the Naval Academy, he was going to be playing at Army-Navy. No, not on the football. Uh, team. He was a musician. So, but Yvette and her, her husband Ben wanted to attend and they didn't have tickets because they were newbies. So I arranged that my tickets, I went to Army Navy with Gordon, I gave, I made arrangements for Yvette to get my tickets so she could go and see her son at, at Army Navy. And, and since then, yeah. her son her son is now a junior, and he is the Commodore of, uh, of Cadets 
at, at, at the Naval Academy. I couldn't be more proud. I have a picture of him in uniform and called me Uncle Stu. I couldn't be more proud. Nothing would make me more proud than that. So let's see. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm missing some people, and I'm sorry about that. But on the cake that you see back there, wait, who am I missing? Oh, oh Lee. Oh. <laughs> Lee. <laughs> Lee. Thank you, Lee. You came here late. Lee actually canceled earlier in the day and then showed up anyway. <laughs> Lee, Lee at the Daily News was one of these unsung, uncredited people that kept the entire operation moving. The Daily News could not publish without the people who do the grunt work, not the columnists who have their pictures in the paper, not the byline reporters, not the big shots like, okay, uh, Maria Gallagher, who is a restaurant critic and other things at the Daily News, and, and we've been friends for like 40 years. Her husband, Ray Dittinger, is one of the best sports writers and analysts in the city of Philadelphia. And of course, they're great lovers of bulldogs who fart a lot. But <laughs> and all of that is true. So, so there, there are these old, old friends. Um, some of you know Jeannie Armstrong, so she's tied up in Texas. She can't be here. There are a bunch of other people. Oh, I was told not to say that. Okay. So, uh, if I missed any of you, uh, I would put your hand up if I missed you. I'll say something. Oh, well, Chuck Peruto is here. Uh, Chuck has been a friend of mine for 40 years. We were neighbors at one time in the same building. He did a little better than I. He's now living in a $3 million mansion. And I'm living in a half a million dollar two bedroom apartment, which is very nice, which I can afford thanks to Bob Simon. So you see how this all, this all ties together. Hey, now, Stu, yes. Don't forget that president of Penn Oh, oh, good. Because thank, of you. Thank you. Oh, thank, because thank you, Bobby. Bobby Booker is the president of the Penn and Pencil Club, one of the colors in, in my scheme. And Bobby, I think, I, I think will tell you that she is now the president of the prestigious uh, Penn and Pencil Club for journalists because I kind of pushed her to get involved because yes, I wanted her, yes, I wanted her to get involved. So thank you, yes, Bobby. I tried to see yes, So is there anybody else? Raise your hand. I don't want to miss anybody. Okay. So okay, now I go back on. I, I go back on script. Oh, Chuck Darrow. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Chuck Darrow worked for the Courier, uh, Courier Post for a really long time before he got his dream job at the Daily News, then he got fucked. <laughs> no fault of his, it's just the way journalism is going now, yes. where, like I say, at the Inquirer, it's a 50 50 plan. And they if you're over me. 50, they didn't okay, buy you more than 50, they want to see you gone. So they didn't even buy me breakfast the next morning. They didn't even, he got fucked and he didn't get breakfast. <laughs> but what I want to tell you about Chuck is he was covering Atlantic City when I got my gossip beat, and I started covering Atlantic City. We both covered Donald Trump. We had personal relationships with Donald Trump. Donald Trump could be extremely nice sometimes, but he's a fucking liar. Okay. But anyway, when I came on to be Chuck, who was basically a competitor of mine, introduced me to the right people in Atlantic City and gave me some advice about who to believe and who not to believe. This was unusually courteous for competitors. But Chuck, Chuck lived in the North, he, was, he grew up in the Northeast and his dream was always to be at the Daily News. And then eventually he got his dream uh, through that uh, guy who we both know, uh, what's up? Mark Frisbee. Frisbee, a strange name, Frisbee, who I enjoy. Nice guy. Uh, awesome. Anyway, so, you know, sometimes you get your dreams and they, they just fall apart. Anyway, but I was happy. I was, I love being a colleague of Chuck Darrow. Okay. So while my professional life closed, back to the script. <laughs> while my professional life closed after 60 years of paid employment, 47 at the Daily News, God love the Daily News, I launched my blog. But the big news is I have published my first novel. It's called Press Card, and it's about a newspaper business, of course. And if you haven't bought your copy already, and I know you all meant to, <laughs> you can contact me through the address on the program that you have. And for those of you watching on YouTube, the address is stubico at gmail.com. And if you can't spell that, don't even bother buying the book. <laughs> uh, 
So before opening the floor to you, uh, I have to acknowledge the little package of love that came to me late in life. I refer, of course, to my dog, Chamorro. <laughs> but even before he came into my life, I received the gift of Chai, my best friend, my lover, my nurse, my quick person. Would you please come up here? My proofreader, my everything. She made this party happen, so you can thank her. Please do it. I also, I also thank her sister Deborah for the setup in here and for the decorations, and my great friend Chris Dimitri for all kinds of behind the scenes activity. So finally, as I have for decades, I celebrate my birthday with my first office spouse, Mary Flannery, there, who shares my birthday. In addition to Mary, this year there is someone else who shares our birthday, that is Marcus Perez. Marcus was incarcerated uh, and serving a wrong print, uh, prison sentence that I spent a decade trying to get reversed. I was really not successful. It did get reversed, but not because of me. Uh, during that period, when I visited him in Greaterford, now there's a treat, yeah. we sh I, I learned that we shared the same birthday, and we vowed that someday we would celebrate together. That day has arrived. So, yeah. 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 Let's do a little more. No, 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 no. Uh, so, uh, anyone who wants to, to can come up and speak for a couple of minutes. Uh, but we will start with my office spouse and my birthday mate, Mary Flynn. Department of the Daily News. I was assigned the desk face to face with his. And so I heard every word he said, every conversation. We discovered we shared the same birthday, and so our joint celebration began. For many years, my husband, Grant Connors, and I would celebrate going out with Stu, most recently with Chai, for on our birthday dinner. But this, of course, is a special year, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I remember when he thought he needed to buy a gun. Excuse me. When he took on the serious subject of mistreatment of animals. I thought I knew everything about Stu, but after reading press card, I must admit, I learned some new things about Stu. I mean, Claude Shelby. <laughs> what we all know about Stu is that he cares deeply about friendship, loyalty, and residents of this city, city excuse me, and this country. In fact, I'd say he put the people in the people paper. And now he shares his opinions in his blog and in press card. Congratulations. Okay. So with that done, anyone who wants to come up and say two minutes. Please do so now, after which we will have the coffee and birthday cake. Okay. And introduce yourself to the crowd, please. I'm not Stu Barkowski, I can assure you that. <laughs> My name is Michael Seidman. I met Stu when we moved into Center City One. I knew when I first met Stu, there was going to be a time in my life when I give him the shirt off my back. That time has finally arrived tonight. Because when I got Stu's invitation, I wanted to get a shirt that would befit him. I went online and I found this great shirt. But when it came time to put in the size, I either had drank too much of my vodka or smoked too much of my medical marijuana. And I hit the wrong size. So I have no alternative but to as I said, I wanted to do when I first met Stu, give him do a shirt. <laughs> Someday I will fit into that shirt. 
Ponytail. You decided the 60s are over? Okay. Uh, who wants to come up next? Okay, we're, okay. Well, oh, oh, oh. Uh, get ready. Let, let's call on. Oh, uh, okay. Bobby before my sister. Because you're no, my sister. sister. I am your sister. Your sister. Okay. I is your okay. sister. <laughs> Listen, uh, my name is Bobby Booker, and I, you know, I've um, I've been a part of this media uh, mix in Philadelphia for now four decades. But more than anything, I have always just applauded what Stu has done. I ain't never always agree with him. I mean, he's got some opinions, but more than anything, I want y'all to know that Stu has always been ahead of the curve before. Anybody, especially at the Pen and Pencil Club, a place I used to just go and hang out at, was thinking about the future. Stu appealed to me, at this point now, we're talking maybe a dozen odd years ago, to think about going into a leadership position, not in the position that I am now, just joining the board, helping, and in his words, um, diversifying what was really a white male journalist club. Elderly. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Elderly one. But, but that's because Stu also looked out and saw a lot of the things that I was doing when other people didn't see it. And I used to go and, and kind of crash into Stu's office. He, he didn't know how I got there. But I would always show up in his office, and I was a part of, uh, let's just say I was a, a member of the, what's that, the credit union or whatever. And I took advantage of being in that credit union and would go to his office, which was in the subterranean part of the Daily News at that point. And Stu would regale me with stories and show me so many of the things that he shared with you today. He would pull out these papers and things, and I would share with him and he listened to me. And more than anything, he encouraged me. And mind you, long before whatever has happened, has happened to me uh, uh, becoming the president of this legacy club, I was just so honored that Stu recognized and encouraged me. Now, mind you, we can always be on different sides of the fence about a lot of things, but more than anything, this guy right here is a good guy, and he gets it. And because of that, there's been a big difference in what is the media community here in Philadelphia. And whether or not he gets credit for it is a whole nother thing. I'm just here, and that's the reason I came to this mic, to make sure that people know that Stu has always been a catalyst for change. And we need to make sure that when our journalists, our people who document what it is that matters in our world, move into other platforms, we support and encourage that. So definitely hit that blog, buy that book, buy several copies, share it, share the blog link. It is a good book. I've already bought two copies and I'm buying two more. But, but, but more than anything, all of the names that he has mentioned in this room, all of these folk who are going through their troubles, who have made their transitions to other platforms, support and encourage and make sure that they're a part of your dynamic. More than anything, I'm just saying this publicly. Stu, I love you like an old soul record. You are all right with me. I smell marvelous. It's uh, at the Dior. Uh, what do I wear? Chai? I forget. Oh, chai. I've, I've been drinking. So it's the uh, Dior black something. In any event, um, I, I did want to. I did want to say something else. I think it's important. In this room right now, we have representatives from the wingnut right, the Trump people. We have the crazy lefty loony progressives in here, all of whom are my friends. I'm in the middle. My Trump people say I'm a socialist like my parents and my daughter. 
I'm not. The, uh, the left-wing people say I'm a fascist. I'm not. I'm really in the middle. I try to, to conduct myself as, as you know, following what facts are. So sometimes my conclusions and my opinions are controversial. Good. You should listen to the other side. If the only thing you listen to is Fox News, you're wrong. If the only thing you listen to is MSNBC, you're wrong. Listen to the other side. I've been saying that for 20 years. Nobody listens. All right. My sister. Next. Buckle your seatbelts. No, not this time. I left out the worst of it. I couldn't do that to an old man. Most of you have known my brother for more than 10 years. Most, I think most more than 25 years. Anyone more than 50 years? No. Well, congratulations well, for sticking with him as long as you did. I'm good. Okay. Me, I've been with my brother, which is how I have always referred to him, and he with me for more than 75 years. But I had no choice. <laughs> We grew up in the same family, I think. <laughs> Some of our memories are similar, many are not. What memories we do share are of a poor, first-generation, American, hardworking, and socially-minded family. We grew up in a politically active <clears throat> family, walking on picket lines, marching on Labor Day, in Labor Day parades, singing Union and Socialist songs. Our father was the president of every organization he joined, because he could always do it better than anybody else. And for free. <laughs> and never, <laughs> never took a dime for right. anything. He was even the first male president of our elementary school PTA. <laughs> he, he signed my graduation card <laughs> from uh, elementary school. Mom was secretary of everything because she supported my father in everything he did. And she could type. And she could type. She typed all my papers. We grew up within half a block of both sets of grandparents, with our papa stepping in, stopping in every night after work, after working in a seltzer bottling shop all day. We grew up with Lucky, the best dog in the world. No, uh, no, nothing for tomorrow, but Lucky was special. We grew up with tuna croquettes, bananas and cream, canned croup. Fruit, fruit, cocktail, and never anything green on the table. <laughs> I didn't meet a salad until I met my husband's family. <laughs> <laughs> Stu was a Boy Scout, not happily. And I was a joyous Girl Scout, while Mom was the best cookie chairman in the world. Stu was really bright. He made the SP, which is two years instead of three in junior high school. But not highly motivated. I didn't make the SP, but excelled in school. Stuart was not motivated to please our parents while I was all over that. <laughs> Stuart was the firstborn son in a Jewish household, the king, the doctor, the golden child. But he, as he was, as he has always been, he chose the path less taken becoming a problem for our parents and a royal pain in the ass for me. He seems to have liked that crooked path. He has no problem taking views that are sure to irritate some. He is willing to take a stand. For many years, age and stage differences and physical distance kept us apart, as well as some other things. <laughs> but 18 years ago, I called my brother with news of a cancer diagnosis and a very poor prognosis. It was then that I saw my brother's heart. It was then that I learned he had one. <laughs> the past years have been great, maybe worth waiting 50 years for. Just shows you should never give up on family. Now we talk, we share, we're honest, we enjoy each other. We both end every conversation with I love you. I am glad to have rediscovered my big brother, and I wish you a healthy, healthy, happy birthday. Love from all the people I have been in your life, Baby, Phoebe, and Andrea.
referencing a novel that I don't recall reading. But then again, I don't recall what I had for lunch today. So thank turkey you. Turkey sandwich. Uh, thank you. Uh, turkey sandwich. Somebody's telling me turkey sandwich. I will take your word for it. That's my granddaughter. Uh, okay, Chuck Darrell, you want to go next? I see uh, Chuck Caruto is warming up. <laughs> well, um, I'm actually a little surprised that you, you know, to be invited tonight because, to be honest, I figured you'd be dead by for years by now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, it is such an honor to be considered, a, a, obviously, a friend of Stu's because I can remember, I, I was a little boy, three, four, five years old. My grandfather used to put me on his knee and read me by cops and stuff. So, the, the, thing, the thing that, you know, <laughs> I'm here tonight. But in all seriousness, the one thing, you know, Stu's been called a lot of things, good, bad, and whatever, and everything in between. But in all seriousness, I, my respect for this man really knows no bounds because he was, he, and he is, fearless, which a lot of reporters and journalists are not. Um, he is talented. He is a, an entertaining writer, something that, the city, especially these days, has a surfeit of. I think that's the right word, right? Surfeit? Yes. Um, even if I didn't agree and don't agree with his stuff, even to this moment, he really is an entertaining read. He, he gets, he bites down on the bones, they say. But most of all, the reason that um, that I have so much respect and admiration for Stu is, and again, in all seriousness, because from the time I was 13 or 14. All I ever wanted to be, I never wanted to be a journalist. I think that is the most pompous, self-serving, self-important word. I'm sorry, that's just me. And if I offended any journalists here tonight, my, that's not my intent. But all I ever wanted to be was a newspaper guy. And I can't think of a better, I don't think he was a role model, because that's not necessarily true. But once I got into the business as a kid at the Temple News and started seeing Stu's stuff regularly, that's when I started reading the Daily News, Stu to me is like something that really is not a part of the media today. Stu is the quintessential and the ultimate newspaper guy. And he, he, lo he, he worships the idea of that printed word, but he never, ever, took himself or takes himself seriously and that to me is I mean I, I can't tell you how much that means personally to me because I saw that you can do that you can be a serious guy in a newspaper serious about your job that you want to get things right you want to make a difference you want to have a voice but um, you know Stu never saw himself as so many journalists do as somebody who is above, above other people uh, better than other people, and that to me is, is to, the most important thing raw about Stu. And I want to just leave you because I think we can all agree that if there was one word, if we, if we had to sum up Stu in one word, that would be attitude. Not attitude, attitude. And I think that this, this short story anecdote will um, explain that. Stu, you probably don't remember this, although I think we, I might have brought it up to you once or twice in the in a, intervening 35 years or so. But one day, I have no idea what the, the occasion was, but Stu and I found ourselves covering some press event at the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. And we were walking through the, uh, to get to where we had to go, um, we had to cut through the casino. And it was, it was early, it was like 11.30 in the morning, like a weekday morning. So it wasn't, it wasn't very crowded. And we passed a 10, an open $10 blackjack table. That at which only one other person was sitting. This was a woman, probably in her 50s or 60s, something like that. And she was playing heads up with the dealer. And Stu said, wait a second, I'm gonna play. So he pulls a 20 out of his wallet or pocket or whatever, he throws it on the table. The dealer gives him four red chips, five dollars each, puts ten, two chips in the little circle there, gets dealt a 12, 10 and a two. And he's sitting, he's sitting to the right of the woman. And he takes the other two chips and says, double down. Now, I'm sure even people who've never set foot inside the casino know that you never double down on 12. <laughs> never, <laughs> right? And the dealer shows the card, and gee, what a surprise, it was a 10. So he busted, he lost his $20, and the woman sitting at the table gave him 
the dirtiest, like, you are such an a-hole look. Like, 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 greatest I've ever seen. And, and this, uh, to me anyway, always, always summed up Stu. Stu looked at her and said, you, you know, lady, if I had hit a nine, you would have thought I was the best fucking jack, blackjack player in the world. <laughs> and, and that to me is it, cool. Happy birthday, my friend. Thank you, Chuck. If you like me so much, why wouldn't you let me have dated your daughters? <laughs> I, I because you don't have enough money. What else? I think I was at both bat mitzvahs. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. I don't remember that anecdote at all, but I believe you. No, that, that happened. I, 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 I'm sure I did. I like to sit at third base. I, I, when I was well, not sitting was, in my seat, that's where she then was it was wrong. I think that's just where she was sitting. But, but I've used that, I call that that story many times <laughs> about the idea of try it. What do you got really at the end of the long run? It's, 10 20, for it's 10 20 bucks. And it's the cost of my fucking book. And it's it. nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. Head, it's one drink in a center city really, bar. And her head would have exploded had you hit that nine. <laughs> yes. And I would have given her, I would have given her half my money. <laughs> Actually, I would have. If she would have given me a hand job. Okay, I'm sorry I said that. I'm really, I'm really sorry I said that. Uh, it's not me. It's the Jack Daniels talking. Okay, so Yvette, stop laughing like that. Uh, oh, Chuck Peruto, candidate for district attorney. Would you like to come up and take the mic? Thank you, pal. I really, I, I feel it's, I'm so welcome here. I'm so warmly received. I walk in and a libel lawyer gives me a card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. I'm running for DA and uh, I'm glad Stu could let me say a few words. I've known him a long time. We both used to live in Center City together. In the same building. In the same building. He used to knock on my door all the time and ask for sugar. <laughs> How does he know my girlfriend's name? <laughs> anyway, I did some research on Stu for tonight. In high school, he was most likely to climb a bell tower with a rifle. <laughs> so he went into journalism to take shots, such more better shots, and you get less, less likely to get arrested. By the way, in 42 years of practicing law, the criminal law exclusively, amazingly enough, I never represented Stu. <laughs> I guess if I were a libel lawyer, I'd probably have a client. <laughs> Stu used to get the scoop on some things, I don't know how. One time I accidentally strangled Howard Eskin in the palm. <laughs> accidentally. You have my word as an attorney. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's in the front page of the Daily News. How did you get that scoop? <laughs> I used to say publicity is like sex. When it's good, it's great. And when it's bad, Still pretty good. <laughs> Does anybody here remember when Stu got a Pulitzer Prize? <laughs> he doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> he also doesn't remember how to dress or how to stay single. He's had more wives than Larry Krasner has gun convictions. <laughs> and I'm trying to explain to him the concept of alimony. And he says to me, girls don't marry reporters for their money. I just looked at him and said, all right, forget it. <laughs> In all seriousness, I want to toast still his 80th, but it's the new 60. He really has been a tremendous friend over the years. I mean, a really tremendous friend. And I can honestly say, he's taking care of me, but he won't, he really won't lie. I mean, if I give him a story that he suspects, like my age when I was younger, I was dating a girl much younger than me, and Stu calls me up out of the clear blue sky because he saw me coming in the building with her. And he goes, how old are you? So I'm figuring, oh, she's gonna read this. So I shaved five, six years off my age. 
and he prints it. And he used to have birthdays every year. He would repeat your birthday. And for five years, I got a lot of mileage out of this. So five years, people would, people who knew me are like, how did you pull that off? How did you pull that off? So one day, Stu must have got the tip. He calls me up. And you can tell in his voice that he knows. He calls me up. How old are you? And I, I know I was going to lie again. He goes, so all these years you got me lying. He goes, I, don't, I still don't believe you now. I want you to photocopy me right now before you have a chance to doctor it. A copy of your driver's license. But he gave me too much time. <laughs> I, can honest, I can honestly say there's not too many reporters that can, I could say have really carried me over the years. Stu Bykowski has carried me. Sometimes you just need a break because some reporters just like to bust them for you to your right and to your left. But Stu, thank you. And happy birthday. And by the way, I'm a tremendous sports fan. I am happy to have been a year. Okay. Let's raise it and jerk for those of you who are out of town. Uh, the outstanding football analyst. He's in the Football uh, Writers Hall of Fame. Um, married to uh, Maria Gallagher, an old friend of mine from the Daily News, and uh, they don't get any better than Ray Dittinger. Not just because he knows everything, but he is totally fair to people. He won't take a shot at anybody. He won't take a cheap shot at all. If it's a deserved shot, he will take the shot. But basically, he doesn't do that. He just lays the facts out. He lets you understand what the facts are. And pretty much, you know, you can make up your own decision. Yeah. Okay. Kyrie Hill is standing here. A threatening, a threatening uh, presence, I think. So, okay. Um, I've had a few drinks. So. No, no shock there. Um, I just want to say, and this is going to be short, there was nothing more exciting than being in Stu Bykowski's column when you're trying to make it somewhere. And you would wake up in the morning and still would give you a hint. He wouldn't tell you what he was saying, but you're going to be in it. And I would wake up and you would wait for the daily news to be printed and I'd drive to the 7-Eleven at whatever morning to get the daily news and I would get, I was like, yes! And then the internet happened. And you could go online around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and you could see the story. Well, I had the mistake of telling Stu that one day. <laughs> Stu, I saw the story. I saw it online at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. And Stu would reply, you fucking motherfucker. You piece of shit son of a bitch. You're going to kill this business. Go out and buy the fucking paper for 50 fucking cents. This is literally what he would say. And save this fucking business. This was 20 years ago. And he was right. I never, ever did not buy an issue that I was in or after that, after he cussed me out. So I'm sorry the way things went, but you were right. You said 20 years ago this was going to go down. Now, another thing is, I, I, I didn't know if this was a roast or not. So I told a friend of mine I'm going to, you know, roast Stu Bykowski. And he said, ah, you can't do that anymore. It's cancel culture. You say something, I'm going to cancel you. And you can't, you know, you, you, you've got to, they might be videoing it, as they are. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about the story that, uh, and then I wanted to talk about the time we went to, no. <laughs> and then I wanted to say, yeah. so I can't, I can't say anything of roast or roast that, but I will say this, but I was offended because I, I bought Stu's book and he said I'm going to write something in the, uh, uh, in, in the inscription and he said, I agree you have nice values. I was offended <laughs> that you said I have nice values. I am as much of a scumbag as you are. And the fact that you said I had nice values offended me. That's all I have to say. And also, still is my idol, and I'm going to leave this if this makes the video or not. Stu met Linda Lovelace. 
And there's a picture of him with her, but he won't tell me what happened after he met her. I'll leave it at that. She's Happy saying, birthday, buddy. She said it was no big thing. Thank you, Tiger. Thank you so much. Uh, all she of said, that, excuse me, she said it was no big thing. I no, no. <laughs> all, all of that bad language that, uh, that Tiger talked about, that was Claude Shelby, it wasn't Stu Wartowski. As you know, I don't fucking talk like that. Okay. Uh, what happened actually with Linda Lovelace, and you can look this up because it was published, I choked Linda Lovelace. I'm not going to say anymore. It is published. Google it. You can find it yourself. Okay. This was in her bedroom at the Bellevue Stratford where I had an interview. She was uh, appearing in town in a show, a, a farce called Pajama Tops, where basically she was naked most of the time. She was a great interview. She was, it was wonderful. But uh, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to go any further there uh, right now. Uh, I want to screen the room, and I see Bob <laughs> Hanlon, one of my neighbors. He has his hand up. Would you like to come up here and speak? I'm actually going to stay right here, Samantha. Project. Oh, gosh. Project. Okay, okay. I'm Samantha, so you'll have to turn that oh, around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. now Bob is the director now. <laughs> yeah. A little change of any. So I'm the only one walking around with this book. And I don't know why I'm the only one. I do. Stu promised me a free toaster if I would walk around and get five additional copies of Burgess tonight. So if you need to look at it, it's right here. Yes. Stu, uh, I live in the same uh, condominium unit as Stu, and um, Stu is the first famous person I've ever known. Actually, Stu is the only famous person I know. And the only reason I know that Stu's famous is because he told me so. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first met Stu, I started reading his columns, and the first columns I read were to the right of center, they were conservative. I would say, oh my gosh, Stu's a conservative journalist. Isn't this great? That made five of us in Philadelphia who were, had conservative voices. <laughs> I was so excited about that, but then I kept reading Stu, and then I saw some of his articles going to the left, and I said, Stu, what are you doing? You're going to the left. And then some back to the right, some to the left, and some in the center, and finally I figured out that Stu is all about the truth and writing about the truth. And it took me a while to recognize that and appreciate that, which brings me to his book. And I wanted to read a part of his book, but before I read that, I was in a fraternity for four years at a university in Pennsylvania. I thought I knew all of the obscenities that could ever exist. <laughs> oh my God. Within the first two to three yes. chapters, yes. I realized I didn't know all of the obscenities that exist. It was very good. But anyways, um, what I wanted to appreciate was uh, Stu's dedication in his book. So I am reading the books through, I'm like two thirds, one third of the way through. It's a very good read. Um, the dedication here, is to the 94.6, and I don't know where that number came from, to the 94%, 94.6% of journalists, quietly competent, who do their best to find and report accurate information in order to provide readers and viewers with the tools they need to make wise decisions. I loved reading that. I just appreciate Stu for his his striving towards the truth in your reporting. So cheers to, to Stu on that. So, and that's not all. That's not all. Briefly. So, we were running out of time. So briefly, I also want to acknowledge Stu's work ethic. Um, my wife and I watch a TV show called uh, Bosch, uh, based on Michael oh, Connolly's okay. book. One of the great, if any of you watched it, you've seen Bosch in his cubicle and the sign behind it. It says, get off your ass and go out and knock on doors. I remember being in the lobby of Center City One. It was hot, it was humid, it was miserable. I think Stu was struggling a little bit with the knee thing. And I said, Stu, where are you going? And he says, well, the parking authority issue was up 
And I'm there, yeah, so what are you doing? And he says, I need to go out and talk to the people who are involved with this. And I said, wow, I, I just so admired Stu for getting out and talking to the people who were involved in what was going on. So to Stu, congratulations on 80, but also a recognition and acknowledgement of your striving for learning what's going on and speaking the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, we have one. Anybody else over there? We got two. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, one of my new friends, my attorney, Bob, uh, excuse me, Mark Schwartz. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, I'll plead guilty that I gave my card as a libel lawyer to Chuck Peruto. Mark. <laughs> He, uh, I feel still like a transplant. I moved here in 86, and I'm just honored to be in this room with so many people that I really can consider to be stalwarts for progress and truth justice. I know that um, this is supposed to be funny, um, and what I can tell you is that it's hysterical to work with Stu. I mean, every single one of our phone calls, I feel like you know I'm the one being benefited. Plus, now representing Stu, I don't have to watch the Discover Channel. I don't have to watch HBO. I watch one video all the time. And I'll let you guess which video that is. Um, Stu mentioned basically where he came from. And I think that that's important. I spent some time in New York back in the 90s representing a client pretty much full time. And Stu is one of a very small number of colonists that came from Brooklyn, a la uh, Breslin. There's a documentary on HBO on yeah. two columnists. And Stu is, is, is not just perhaps part of that generation or the young part of that generation, but he's the real thing. And you know, it remains to be seen whether other people are gonna be able to take up that mantle. So, um, I know this isn't funny, but I'm privileged to know him. I'm privileged to have renewed some friendships with people who were in that video. And, um, you know, I, I, I really just feel honored that I can represent Stu and uh, the fact that he knows a lot of lawyers. There's a lot of lawyers he's known, and I was honored to represent him with respect to his buyout after he had just covered a, he had covered the client whose case is still unresolved because of COVID. Um, so he knew, I, I'm just incredibly honored because he knows a lot of lawyers who've been here a lot longer, a lot more prestigious, and people like Chuck Perito has the ability to do what I'm doing, probably in, 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 in multiples. Um, so it's an honor and it's a privilege and um, you're, you're the real thing. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge that Mark is an old-time liberal, which is not the new version of illiberal, and one of his clients was a Trumpster, who basically got into trouble for uh, posting things on her own Facebook page about her own personal opinions that had nothing to do with her job, and she got in trouble. And Mark, who probably hates Trump even more than I do, defended this woman on principle, the principle of free speech. And that's what all time liberals believe in, but the new progressives don't seem to. Okay. Well, that's very nice, but now we've got, we have got, we've got, we've got to keep it down to like one minute each because we're running behind schedule. You know, I'm type A and we have cake and coffee. Uh, and I see somebody pointing at Yvette. Yvette, who will soon be leaving the Philadelphia Inquirer slash Daily News. Yvette, who is one of the dear people who had my back in a hostile work environment. Of course, Stu, I had your back. I just want to say happy birthday and thank you for inviting us. I love you. This is all I had to wear still. This is all I really all out. This is too bad. You didn't still. This is all I had. But anyway, I I just, I'm grateful that you invited us or invited me. Ben's on the way. Big Ben's on the way. Uh, young Ben had to come from the academy to watch Grandpa so we could both come. But I just wanted to say that all kinds of things have been said about Stu. One thing that I forgot to, to say to you 
is that once there was a meeting and we had too many columns, you know, we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller in journalism. And I went into the meeting and I said, look, you can get rid of everybody, but you can't get rid of Stu because Stu is the closest thing we have to a conservative on the entire staff. <laughs> Clearly, the fact that Stu's gone means that I lost, and the fact that I'm leaving in four days means that <laughs> I wasn't successful either. Um, but uh, on, on a more serious note, you know, over the years I've heard all kinds of things said about Stu. Yeah. Stu is probably one of the hardest working, committed people that I've ever worked with. You know, one thing we did in journalism, they kept changing the systems. We went from we went from Kronos to all these different systems, and and that for Stu that meant that he had to relearn these new systems. And Stu relearned all these new systems as well. He, but you know what? He got it all down as well as the millennials, if not better. And you know he he just did a great job. You know, over the years I've heard people who are critics of him talk about say things negative things about him. Oh, he's a racist. He hates women. He's this. He's that. <clears throat> And I could never support any of that because at the end of the day, all I know is how he's always treated me and my family. I got to know Stu much more once we all moved over to the Inquirer, which was a very hostile environment. It was like we were the stepchildren going to, you know, the high end family members' homes, and it was a trip. But, um, I, only, I just only have good things to say about Stu. I mean, Stu mentioned earlier that <clears throat> he talked to his friend Gordon and gave up his ticket so that I could go to the Army Navy game with my son. I mean, we didn't know anything about any of that. You know, we got in, <clears throat> and by the time we knew anything about getting the tickets, they were gone. And I walked in one day, and Stu was like, hey, are you going to this game? And I was like, no, tickets, no Stu, the tickets are gone. And for the last couple of years, Stu has given up his tickets and connected us used his connection with um, Gordon to help us. But the part that he didn't tell you was so the first year, Trump is, you know, the president and my son's supposed to play in the drum and bugle corps for, you know, in front of the president. And in addition to helping us with the tickets, my son forgot his lyre. The lyre is that metal piece that goes on your instrument that holds the, the words that, you know, you play. And they want them all to be the same. Well, my son left his at the in Annapolis. So, lo and behold, I mean, I called all over, but it was Stu, with all of his connections, who ended up finding someone who, connect, who was connected to the Mummers, who was connected to somebody in Cherry Hill, who, <laughs> you know, who he sent us to, who actually got a liar for us, so that this kid was ready. It was 11, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, but he did that. The, the, the whole point I'm trying to make is Stu is just, <clears throat> he's a lot of things, but he's good, he's kind, you know, he's decent, and I just like to say, Stu, that I always say to people, I don't care what it, whatever anybody says about you, I, I'll always have your back, because you're good people. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, well, I'm, I'm told by the boss we have to be out of here by 10. So I do I do want to hear anybody who wants to speak, but really keep it to 60 seconds, because we've we got the coffee. <laughs> We've got the cake. Mark Siegel. Is there any chance he would keep it to 60 seconds? Let's try Steve Essig first. Steve, I think, uh, will actually keep it. Steve was actually my first editorial assistant. Couldn't get hired by the Inquirer, so he went to the Allentown uh, Morning Call, where he became a star reporter for 60 years. All right, uh, Stu said I uh, worked for him in like the late 90s through 2000. Stu was at my bachelor party, he was at my wedding, and all I want to say is, as Yvette said, that this guy, no matter what anyone says, is a hard role. Not one birthday has gone by since I worked with him. Not one wedding anniversary has gone by without a card coming to my house. So, that's all I want everyone to know about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> a piano player would like to say something. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kenny Gates, pianist, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Migrated to Philadelphia and was the first pianist at the Prime Ridge Restaurant five nights a week for five years. Stu came through. The next thing I know, my name was in the newspaper. And all of the few, this is a joke among Philadelphia musicians. So you, you've been here two months, 
and you got Stuba and Vyskovsky, and we've been here forever, and he never entered me up. Have a good one. Oh, that's a good one, Brooklyn. You know, we got to take care of each other. Joe Roy, uh, producer extraordinary. One minute, one minute. I've known Stu for over 50 years. All right, I've known him for 49 years. I was close to 50 years. Um, I started Grendel's Lair in 1972 when I was 20 years old. Wow. And every Tuesday or Wednesday, I would make the rounds between the Bulletin, the Inquirer, the Journal, the Philadelphia Daily News, with photos of the act for that weekend. It was very important to get a photo in the Friday papers. Otherwise, we'd have to pay for it, which was very expensive, considering that I was running a folk club after the folk era had ended. <laughs> well, Stu was very supportive back in those days. He was the entertainment editor of the Daily News. And I used to be there every week. One week in particular, I really needed to get a photo in. I had told him on the phone. He said, bring me a pastrami sandwich. <laughs> I showed up with a pastrami sandwich. The photo was in the paper. It was that easy. <laughs> Thank you very much for being supporting That is a true story. I hate to think that I could be bought for that little, but uh, it wasn't the pastrami sandwich. Phil wanted to get the picture, and I said, get the fucking picture here by 1 o'clock and bring me a pastrami club. Well, he did. Now, I want to use the damn picture anyway, because here's a young guy trying to make his way in the world, and my one of my roles as a, as an editor, as a journalist, is, is to help people. I was happy to do that. Happy birthday. Come on. So, okay, we, we've, uh, this is fabulous here. Is there anybody else who wants to speak? What? I know we do Is there anybody else who wants to speak? Otherwise, I will just say thank you all so much for coming here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.